five, six, seven, eight. If I were to describe my idea of the first circle of hell catered just for me, it would be if I were tasked to mingle with strangers who wanted to make small talk with me for hours on end. The idea of having conversation about the weather, current events, or your favorite this and that makes my skin crawl. And while this might seem rude or shallow to some, let's reframe this as, I'd rather get to know people on a deeper level and have no problem listening to your inner thoughts verbalized. I'd love to give you my sole focus, so let's make that conversation one-on-one. -on -one. Every response I give you is carefully considered and created just for you. And when this thorough analysis eventually drains me, as it always does, I will retreat into solitude. I will find peace in introspection, often expressing myself in silence. I will read and write for hours and hours, recharging myself. All of this might resonate with you if you, like me, are a highly sensitive, overstimulated, underrated introvert. Howdy, my loves. Originally, this video was going to be a discussion of the book Quiet by Susan Cain that discusses the power of introverts in a world that cannot stop talking. And originally, I was just going to read it and kind of review it as well as the journal that comes with this book because there are some really thought-provoking questions within there. But the more I started to read the book, the more and more I started to relate to the sentiments that were expressed within it. And if there's one thing that really resonated with me, it's that our perspective and our content contribution as introverts are often disregarded and undervalued. So I thought I would make a video kind of discussing how I move through the world as an introvert, how the world regards me as somebody who does need to be a little bit more on the reserved side as a natural part of my identity. That kind of disregard and upholding of extroverts being the top individuals is what Kane refers to as the extrovert ideal, a value system that prioritizes extroverted individuals, risk takers, people who gain energy from other people. I feel like ever since I was a kid, I always kind of knew that I was different. I was very reserved. I was very on the quiet side, especially if I had changes in my environment. So my mom loves to tell the story that as a kid, I had transferred to a new school for first grade. I was out on the playground first day and we had to get up in these lines. And two girls recognized me from soccer practice came up to me and were like Julie hi like we're so excited to see you and I stood there and played dead because I did not want to talk to anybody I didn't know what was going on fun fact one of those girls turned out to be my best friend in the whole world who I'm still friends with I remember as a kid that was just how my parents described me quiet not really participating in my environment more so observing it I mean as a kid I really didn't feel uncomfortable with the way I was you don't really have the urge to compare yourself yet to other people especially back then because there was no social media so like there's no FOMO as a child I really never paired myself to others I never thought oh my god I, I wish that I was so into team sports I just knew what I was and what I was about and honestly sometimes I miss the way I was when I was a kid that's why I really like the song seven by Taylor Swift remember me before I learned civility like I used to scream there's something to be said about when you're a kid yourself is all you know it wasn't until I started growing up that I started to be reprimanded for the way I was. Like everyone was like, oh my god, your, your kid's so quiet, that's awesome. But then suddenly when it's middle school, high school, college, they're like, what's wrong with your kid? I tried to do team sport to put myself in that situation where I'm around people. When I drain my energy, when I make that decision to do something that I know will drain my energy, I make it because I am either A, passionate about it, or I'm doing it for someone I love. And I was not passionate about it, and there was nothing I loved about being on, on a soccer or a basketball team, and I knew right then and there that that was the wrong decision for me. There were things that I cared about, and it wasn't that, and I knew it. As I grew older, I started to become very cognizant of the ways in which my environment was not supporting my personality. Group projects, Socratic seminars, public presentation. These challenges were touted as ways to foster productivity and collaboration, despite research actually showing the 
quality of the product that you produce upon working with people actually diminishes. And so as I went through school, I learned that in order to be counted as a well-rounded individual, not only for high school, but for colleges, I had to exemplify behaviors that were unnatural to me. In other words, I had to behave like an extrovert. Otherwise, as Kane says, I was going to be discounted because of a trait that goes to the core of who I am. And in high school especially, I was reprimanded for not participating enough in a school event. Not because like I had anything against the sport, it was just so draining to me to be at school where like it was loud, there was people who needed things from me. It was just an environment that was particularly draining to me and all I wanted to do was escape that. Not so I could go home and like just sit in my room in silence, although that would have been fun. I wanted to be dancing, I wanted to go to work, take piano lessons, go home and like post on my bookstagram which I was doing even before it was cool. Those are all things that I love to do innately and I was reprimanded for it. As I went through high school and college, I somehow learned that in order to advance socially and professionally, I had to, as T.S. Eliot says, to prepare a face to meet the faces you meet. I learned that I would be more palatable depending on how I said something regardless of what I actually said. And this was really hard for me as someone who took long amounts of time processing and analyzing information before responding. Kane says in her book, introverts focus on the meaning they make of the events swirling around them. Extroverts plunge into the events themselves. And even though I was using enormous amounts of time of my mental bandwidth to create something, in my opinion, worthwhile, I would still be perceived as less intelligent than my talkative, quick to act counterparts. And unfortunately, I really resentful of the introverted part of myself, especially as I became an adult and enter the workforce, the job that I currently have is seen as typically extroverted role. And I resided in a place of cognitive dissonance constantly because I believe there was some innate part of me that was putting me at a disadvantage. Not only in terms of performance of the actual tasks my job required, but also in the ability to verbalize my efficiency at that job. As Kane mentions, people's respect for others is based on their verbal abilities, not their originality or insight. You have to be someone who speaks well and calls attention to yourself. It's an elitism based on something other than merit. Anyone who has had to negotiate a raise or a promotion knows what I'm talking about. You have to be comfortable boasting about your ability. I've seen it in my workplace. It does not matter how good you are at the work. If you cannot fight for yourself and defend yourself in a way that makes you seem almost better than you are, you will not get recognized for that work. And all the while, you're placed in this open floor plan that corporations love to utilize because it's, again, supposed to promote productivity. But research actually shows the contrary. These setups reduce productivity, impair memory, increase staff turnover, make people sick, hostile, unmotivated, insecure, elevate blood pressure and cortisol, and decrease the likelihood coworkers will help each other. The American workforce was driving me to dislike a huge portion of who I was, and I struggled with how to rectify. I feel like one part of my day that constantly makes me anxious is my work environment. Sometimes I feel that people expect more of me than I am willing to give and therefore I need to become a different person in order to give that. A lot of people say like you sound so different you know, on the phone you know, I don't want to feel like inauthentic. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I feel like I'm like that was the fakest conversation you've ever had. I struggle with it a lot. I think that is like the hardest part of my day is when I reflect back on how I acted and I was like, you don't like who that was. Because I, I never want there to be a sort of dissonance between who I want to be and who I am. My job as a whole really brought forth sort of an internal conflict. I really felt working as I was in a job that was, I felt, meant for an extrovert. It's almost like a bias against me that I feel like I'm working against every day. The fact that I've entered the workforce forced me to confront this nature that I have against that part of myself. Really in high school and college, I was very confident in who I was as a person. I knew who I was. I knew what I was about. I noticed the ways that it was affecting me, but it wasn't that I was getting mad at myself. I was more getting mad at the environment. It wasn't until I got a job and I started to work for myself and become adult that I really started to dislike those parts of myself. And that made me really sad because I used to be very secure and confident in the way that I was. And there was no one on earth that could tell me that I had to change who I was. So 
I felt like I had to figure out why I felt this way, how could I possibly fix it, and not fix me, but fix how I felt about myself. I won't say that it was like just the book that helped me do it, but it definitely gave me evidence-backed research to support the hypothesis that I always had about myself. I feel like the first big mental hurdle that I had to attack was my professional identity and the vendetta I had against myself. Over time, I learned that my ability to observe was a really great skill, especially if everyone in my cohort is prone to acting quickly. And research shows that when mistakes are made, extroverts don't just react, they actually speed up as they are reward sensitive. Introverts are geared to understand what went wrong in the first place and act accordingly, and therefore are needed in times of crisis. Additionally, I started to see my personality as an asset and as a light plate. Originally, I thought when talking to clients, I had to become this other version of myself that was gregarious and bubbly and talkative. But now I see that really all clients need is to be understood and I'm able to do that by asking intensive questions and being an active listener, something that comes very naturally to me as an introvert. In order to foster this mental adaptation, I also found ways to seclude myself in the office. I volunteer for more night shifts so there would be less of a chance I'd have to interact with so many people and I commandeered one of our conference rooms to hide in while I did my work. I know this might seem a little odd and like not very like team player of me and like you know some of my managers do joke like oh that's Julie's office even though it's like a conference room but like I don't care I really realized that like my environment was not supporting me and rather than just complaining about it I could carve out a piece of it for myself I can make room for myself but there are times when I just lock myself in the room to make a bunch of calls so that way I can not be so self-conscious about talking I can take breaks in between my calls and I feel like before I was really afraid to like ask for those things or accommodate myself for those things I don't feel bad anymore like don't feel bad if you need something that's gonna make you feel safer and better and healthier at the end of the day don't be afraid to do that actually within the book there's research that shows that if you act against your personality against your innate natural behavior for too long you can make yourself sick, especially work which takes up a huge majority of your time. Don't feel bad asking for those things or just doing them. What I did for myself within the office, like that example of what I did for myself is what Professor Little refers to as a restorative niche, which is the place you go to when you want to return to your true self. I loved finding this phrase, like I loved hearing this phrase for something that I've been trying to do my whole life and not even just at work. Like within my personal life, I have so many restorative niches that I've carved out for myself, like painstakingly to re-energize myself and to become my true self again. And I feel like the first one, if you followed my channel long enough, you know that I love reading. I am doing a challenge for myself where I'm trying to collect a thousand books and where I'm trying to amass this giant library, like personally for myself. I love going to bookstores. I love reading. And I feel like every time that I get into a book, I feel like I'm stepping outside of myself I think I mentioned the quote before like introverts love to observe we don't love to be within the events themselves and I feel like books allow me to be within the events at a safe distance it feels like a movie is playing in my head as I'm reading and it's like a safe way for me to experience certain events and not only just experiencing and reading the books themselves or like collecting them but also talking about them like I said before small talk or shallow conversation not for me it makes me itchy I don't like it but if you were to ask me to talk about books we could go on and on forever. When I go on dates or like I meet new people and they don't want to talk about books, I'm like, okay, well, I'm out of topics now. That or Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift is a restorative niche in her own. The Aristore concert just rejuvenated the heck out of me. I loved it. And of course, like I said, like I make content about these books. I love sharing my passions and interests in that way. And creating content and participating in social media is another way in which I have created a little niche for myself. I actually asked a friend, she said to me, I think you're kind of introverted and extroverted at the same time because you really articulate 
regulate yourself well, especially online. And she cited one of the main reasons why she thought I was a little bit extroverted because I was doing a lot of online content. When I heard in the book that like introverts gravitate towards online exposure and sharing intimate details about themselves online, it just got me really excited. It kind of explained away why exactly I am so comfortable online. I think the reason that I love creating content so much is like it's like having a delayed conversation with someone. It's almost like you're texting a person, right? Like you have time to create something, carefully consider your response from a safe distance where you're not like pressured to react right away. And in fact, in the book, Kane actually says that the most productive and collaborative environment for people to work together is actually online. I've never considered myself a creative person. When I was a child, I couldn't draw. I wasn't good at painting or any of the traditional senses of artwork. But the minute I was introduced to digital artwork, that's when I thought I was creative. And that's when I found something that made me more of myself. Kane mentioned that there are studies that show that introverts actually are so much more comfortable than extroverts sharing their life online. And there's a quote in the book by Kafka that I just have to share. It's about the process of writing, but I feel the same way about creating content. For writing means revealing oneself to excess, the utmost self-revelation and surrender in which a human being, when involved with others, would feel he was losing himself and from which therefore he will always shrink. And as long as he's in his right mind, that is why one can never be alone enough when one writes. And there can never be enough silence around one when one writes. And even night is not night enough. And I feel that in the presence of others and people, I'm not able to reveal myself to access. Talking to a person and revealing my inner thoughts is not something that I can comfortably do, but I can with social media. It's so crazy that I can't mingle at parties, but I can post for thousands on YouTube. I dread having small talk with my coworkers, and I was comfortable to do a podcast. Number one, it's for online creation, and number two, it was about a deep conversation. We talked about art, we talked about books, we talked about social media and how much we love it. And there's a reason why I gravitate to those type of things versus small talk. And even though I do dread conversation most of the time I am restored I feel by like really deep relationships I feel like I deal with overstimulation quite often a good example of this is like we're going out to like bars or if we're going out to like a really loud restaurant like this isn't a knock at my friends or anything that's happening within the conversation those environments just drain me naturally my mom and my dad really explain it like I just hit a wall I remember we went to the American Dream Mall if you've ever been there, it's like crazy inside. And there's like a Nickelodeon theme park with like a bunch of rides and things like that. There's also an aquarium. My mom was like, okay, we're going to the aquarium. And we're like halfway down the stairs. And she stopped and she goes, mm, never mind. I, I want to go to the Nickelodeon thing. And I was like, wait, what? I was like, I thought you really wanted to see the aquarium. She goes, I know, but I could tell you've hit your wall and I can only go to one or the other. So I'm going to choose the Nickelodeon one. I don't have like a huge friend group, but I do have very good relationships with friends. And even with my family, I'm very close. I feel that those relationships are extremely strong because I can't do anything else. When I interact with those people, I really do invest a lot of my time and energy and mental bandwidth into getting to know them and letting them know me. Romantic relationships, that's for another video. <laughs> Introversion definitely prevents me from casting a wide net, but I think it enhances the depth at which I connect with people that I do meet. All of these restorative niches were ones I carved painstakingly for myself in an attempt to escape this extrovert ideal. And there's a quote in the books by an author I can't pronounce, but it's, enjoyment appears in the boundary between boredom and anxiety when the challenges are just balanced within the person's capacity to act. I need the balance of being pushed to experience new things with the capacity to rest after I experience them. All these new and exciting things are not locked away from They are places I can visit and enjoy deeply as I do most things. But at the end of the day, I have to be alone. And alone to me isn't an adjective. It's another place to go. It's a proper noun. It's a place where no judgment exists, only peace. In this day and age, alone is very misunderstood. I feel like when people say that I'm alone, 
they misconstrue that as me saying I'm lonely. And those are two different things. And I need people to understand that. When I am alone, I am becoming more of myself. And that doesn't mean that being alone has to be like me individualistically by myself. Alone means I'm sitting in my living room with my family. We're not talking, but we're vibing together. Being alone means that I'm silently hanging out with someone. I love sitting on my couch with my friend. We're like scrolling on TikTok and we like nap together. That to me is being alone because it lets me rest. Lonely is a different feeling. That is sadness and the need for other people. If you're an introvert, I feel like you'll understand what I mean when there's a difference between alone and lonely. And so I wanted to make this video for other introverts out there feeling like being the way we are is a disadvantage, something that needs to be changed. I want you to feel empowered in our sensitivity and depth not resentful of it. Kane compares introverts to orchids that can wilt easily, but under the right conditions can grow strong and magnificent. So I hope you'll find your restorative niches and people who make you feel rejuvenated instead of depleted. Even though there are systems in place to discredit us, my issue isn't with the extroverts that are supported. It's with the system itself. I believe that extroverts and introverts need to be regarded equally. And as Carl Jung says, the meaning of two personalities is like the contact of two substances. If there is any reaction, both are transformed. A lot of members of my family are those talkers. They're the risk takers, the reward sensitive. But they're also the people that are responsible for the most fun that I've ever had in my life. I feel that we can serve each other in the way that we're balanced. And unfortunately, in the system that we're currently in, it's heavily catered towards one type of individual. And I think that that balance is needed and called for. My mental health benefited greatly from understanding and appreciating the introverted side of myself. And I'm very grateful to have found this book because it put labels to thoughts I've been having for a while. And it encourages you to figure out what you are meant to contribute to the world and make sure you contribute it. And I think this is part of it, sharing my perspective with those who might be struggling in their own right. So I'll leave you with a last quote. If you're an introvert, find your flow by using your gifts. You have the power of persistence, the tenacity to solve complex problems, and the clear-sightedness to avoid pitfalls that trip others up. You enjoy relative freedom from the temptations of superficial prizes like money and status. Indeed, your biggest challenge may be to fully harness your strengths. You may be so busy trying to appear like a zestful, reward-sensitive extrovert that you undervalue your own talent or feel underestimated by those around you. But when you're focused on a project that you care about, you probably find that your energy is boundless. Look at I started from the street. Look at I started from the ghetto. This I will never make it be.